he says in the groundwork that things we may have heard out on the street about Kant. Okay, so the Metaphysics was published in 1797, and this is one of the last works um, published in his life. Um, and well, I'm going fast over this introduction, but he goes really fast over the introduction also. Um, I just want to point to um, the very bottom of 9 to 10. This is about 216, um, where he says, um, only uh, experience, he says, can teach what brings us joy. Um, so our happiness is something that's determined empirically. Only experience can tell us what will um, so bring us joy. That is a certain kind of feeling of satisfaction. So we, of course, have natural, empirical desires and inclinations. Um, and over the course of our lives, we learn, um, he says, each in his particular way in what he will find those joys. And in the same way, only experience can teach him the means by which to seek them. Um, so what's that? It's only experience can teach us the means by which to seek our joy, the satisfaction of the desires. So this is, so express that last point in language from now. Only experience can teach him the means by which to seek that power of satisfaction. A person cannot know what makes him happy a priori. That's true. So that's the first point that I'm emphasizing there. Is as a matter of empirical experience, we find out what gives us a certain kind of feeling, satisfaction, or happiness, or joy. Okay, but now he says, in addition to that, only experience can teach him the means by which to seek those empirical ends that we found out. Only experience can identify the means by which to seek those empirical ends. What's he talking about? You see, only through experience can one know the categorical narrative. Close. Not the categorical imperative. Hypothetical imperatives. Right, hypothetical imperatives are going to tell us this is what results in that. And so empirically we identify over the course of our lifetime what uh, ends give us joy, which ends are empirically satisfying to us. And also over time we identify the causal pathways to bring those about. The point is there's no way to tell a priori what is going to cause what. Right? That's, that's what science investigates, that's what empirical science investigates. Hypothetical imperatives, the means by which certain objects are brought about. Isn't that a really strong point about the kind of happiness though? You're saying happiness is going to be experienced through something else? Uh, experience, what do you mean? So this is a claim about the means, that, so there are two claims here. One is we don't know a priori what will bring us joy, so happiness is an empirical concept. And then the second claim is that hypothetical imperatives are empirical. So I'm sorry, I, I missed what? I have a concept of happiness. The concept of happiness. Okay, so Kant is definitely thinking of the concept of happiness as being empirical, as being tied to the inclinations that we, <coughs> as it were, happen to have as phenomenal beings. So happiness is tied to um, the experiences that we have as embodied beings. Is that the part that you're unhappy with? I just agree what he thinks happens is how it's. Okay, so, so, so say, say better what you think it is. I mean, 
we might not be able to resolve. I'm talking about having this as the result of achieving the end that you consider to be good, whereas having this for con is an end in itself. Um, right. Maybe I'll put the point in a slightly different way. Um, not all uh, achievements of, not all feelings of satisfaction, not all achievements of the ends that we have are objectively good for God. That's absolutely right. That, that's the part that you're objecting to. I'm objecting that happiness is the result of achievement. He's yeah. saying there's more to happiness than just getting done what you were trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay, well, so for Kant, for sure there's more to doing what we should do than achieving the things we happen to think. And so this sounds, sounds to me like a sort of verbal dispute about whether the label happiness should be confined to our empirical desires or maybe like the proper ends that we will. Because for sure, Kant thinks that there's, there are more proper ends that we should will than what he's calling happiness. And maybe you want an expanded understanding of happiness to include those as well. OK. Um, OK, so, and, and that's just the next point that Kant's making. Um, that although happiness and the means to our happiness are empirical concepts, morality ain't. Morality is uh, binding, necessarily binding, and it applies to everyone a priori. Um, and therefore, he says on page 10, um, so, sorry, so, I mean, we, for Kant, it's, it has to be a priori because it applies to people with necessity. That it's a requirement, as we understand morality, it's a requirement that people act as it says. Um, it's not contingent on any kind of empirical determination. This is what he's saying on page 10. Um, it's very different with the teachings of morality. They command for everyone without taking into account his inclinations, merely because and insofar as he is free and has practical reason. Um, reason commands how men are to act, even though no example of this might be found. And it takes no account of the advantages we can thereby gain, um, and which experience, only experience, could teach us. Okay, now what I want to emphasize about all this is that, as I said with the groundwork, this concerns the justification of maybe the supreme principle of morality. This concerns the basis on which morality rests. Um, so the justification of morality must be operative. The justification of morality can't be based on any empirical qualities that human beings maybe tend to have. Um, but on the other hand, that's only concerning the justification of morality, identifying the binding character of morality. That has to be done a priori. But then in order to apply fundamental moral principles, to, in, to determine what somebody should do here and now in these or those empirical circumstances, well, we have to know about these or those empirical circumstances. Uh, and so Kant says, and he said this at the beginning of the groundwork also, and I'm emphasizing it to you. He says, um, but just as there must be principles in metaphysics of nature for applying those highest universal principles in nature, uh, a metaphysics of morals cannot dispense with principles of application. And we shall often have to take as our object the particular nature of human beings. Empirical, uh, the empirical features of human beings, which is cognized only by experience, only empirically, in order to show in it what can be inferred from universal moral principles. But this will in no way detract from the purity of these principles or cast doubt 
on their a priori source, a priori justification of that. Um, that's to say, in effect, that a metaphysics of morals cannot be based on anthropology, but can still be applied to it. Anthropology is the empirical investigation. Okay, so that, I think, is familiar. I'm emphasizing it. Uh, this next point, I think, might not be uh, as familiar. On 11, this is in section 2 now, um, Kant talks about the faculty of desire. He says, the faculty of desire, it's at 211 on page 11. He says, the faculty of desire is the faculty to be, by means of one's representations, the cause of the object of those representations. And he said again, the faculty of desire is the faculty to be, by means of one's representations, the cause of the object of those representations. So the faculty of, the des of desire is the ability that, well, we have to be the cause of some object, some end, by representing that object, that end. Like thinking about it, having imagining, by considering some end, which then that consideration makes uh, that end. So, notice that this is not a phenomenological characterization of this faculty of desire. He's not saying that the faculty of desire is something that feels a certain way to us. He's not saying that the faculty of desire is when we have a certain pull or felt tug in the direction of some end. It's simply the capacity to cause an end, cause an object, through our representation, through our thinking about it. Um, and what's the attitude towards such an end called? So the faculty of desire uh, is the ability to become the cause of some object through a certain kind of representation of that object. And now I'm asking, what's the attitude toward that object called when we become, through our representation of that object, the cause of it? And the answer is a desire. It's the faculty of desire. So saying we desire something or we have a desire for it means that we can become the cause of that <coughs> through our representation. Um, and notice that we have this faculty of desire because we can cause an end through the representation of that end. Animals can also. Animals have desires too. That is, mere animals have desires too. They can, through the representation of some end, become the cause of that end. Well, uh, for Kant, this suggests that um, there's going to be an important difference. For Kant, there's an important difference between human beings and mere animals. Um, and so this suggests that there are maybe different kinds of desires. Certain kinds of desires that uh, maybe we share with animals, but also other kinds of desires that we have that mere animals don't. Um, look, let me, let me make this as clear as I can. The implication of this is that whenever we will an end, Kant would say we have a desire for that end. Now, while Desires, as I just described them, are not phenomenological. They're not characterized through their empirical uh, features for us. For Kant, pleasure and displeasure are. These are feelings, and therefore they are empirical. Um, so whenever we have 